as you know, Rosemary Wells writes and illustrates splendid books with heart and impishness, with rambunctious, beloved characters, and you know them, Max and Ruby, Yoko, Macduff, do you remember Edward with his water wings? There's Stella, Sophie, Felix, and Nora. With a monumental crash of our hands, not from Nora, let's welcome Rosemary Wells. on this dreary, cold, and raw day. It's a wonderful place to come to, to our library. And it is a marvel that everyone has come out. I'm so honored and so pleased. I'm going to take you on a little trip today. I'm going to take you on a trip to my studio. I've just been speaking to a bunch of kids and parents giving a writer's workshop, which I do regularly. Uh, but we are now having the artist's workshop. And what we're having is a trip to a professional artist's workshop to see the materials and the techniques I use to do the picture books that you find on your library shelves. So without any more ado, we're going to go into that. Do I have any teachers here in the audience? I think figured I've got a lot of teachers because this program that I do, as well as the Writer's Workshop, is very teacher friendly. I try very hard when I appear in front of a class, and this is what you're going to see, to try to teach our American kids who are so wonderful and free and often wild to uh, respect their materials and to revise things and do them two or three times because that's how you get your best work. So uh, in between all of the techniques and everything else that you're going to see are all these little teacher-friendly lessons. And I love teachers' questions. So we'll have a, we'll have a teacher, uh, we'll have a, a question and answer session after it is over. And if anyone needs to be settled down in the meantime, we can always go out and settle anybody very tiny who wants to run around and squirm and make comments. So I'm going to start with a visit to my studio. And after that, I'm going to give you a special treat that nobody knows about. So let's get going. Uh, we'll turn the lights out, and um, we'll start in. We're going to start looking at some of the artwork that I love to do from my many books and from uh, different characters, some of them unpublished. This is Max and Ruby, as everyone can see. And here is Yoko. Yoko is done, in that case, on red sandpaper, blue sandpaper. That's for pastels. This is from the Mother Goose book. This is from a book called Carry Me. This is from Sophie, who is brand new and based on my granddaughter. This is an unused uh, cover from Voyage to the Bunny Planet. More from the Mother Goose book, those wonderful old rhymes, and a book called Love Waves, again done in pastel. I really hate using pastel, but it's so beautiful, I can't help it. This is my studio with my beautiful windows. Oh my goodness, who's in my chair? Who's in my chair? I think that's Francis Wells Arms, being silly as usual. This is how a book is made. This is the very first generation of a book. This is how it looks when I scotch tape down the first draft of a story and paste it into pages. This is a new book. And it is the second stage of a book. And you can see that the artwork here has been placed in, and it is in sketch form. This is a book that will come out next year. 
Then when I get that approved, I go into my final art. And I do it many times. I put it all up on the wall so that I can see the book page after page. This is the first try on that page. Second try. Third draft. Fourth revision. First sketch. Color sketch. Get it right. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. That's the one. I love color. I use all kinds of color. And here we have my inks. We have markers of all different sizes and colors. We have pastels in a bed of rice. We have color pencils, or pastel pencils, just plain color, watercolor, all different shades and colors of the rainbow. I think I own every color in the art store. I try to start with a neat studio. Every morning, in the same way that a violinist or a pianist does scales for an hour before they perform, I give myself a morning exercise. What I have to do here is take a drawing. This is a stamped drawing, not an original line drawing. I have many of them. And I make myself color it in and color it in perfectly. There's a bad myth going around that coloring, coloring books is bad for children, that it limits them. That's untrue. It develops their small motor. And it gives them something that they have a structure of what to do. So. Every morning, 10 minutes, coloring something in, making sure that I don't let the colors run, making sure I paint right up to the line and that I'm not lazy and I forget to turn my paper so the brush always leads the color onto the page at the line rather than over the line. Do it perfectly, Rosemary, absolutely perfectly. One mistake. And you have to start all over again. This gives me a sharp eye and a steady hand. A steady hand. It makes me focus. And during that time, I play Japanese music because it is, or, or Native American flute music because it's very calming. And it focuses me. The line always goes in last. The line drawing has been done many times. I can copy it on my copier. This house happens to be a rubber stamp that I had made of my drawing. And so I have endless ones. I make myself do these lines absolutely perfectly with not a single mistake. Otherwise, I have to do it again. And that's a waste of time. And time is money. And I'm the one who has to pay for all these paints and all this stuff. So I try to be thrifty. Pencil on top of watercolor to make the mortar opaque against the red transparent wash. And I finish it off. And that's my practice for the morning. And then I throw it away. Into the bin it goes, I tear it up. It's not worth anything. It's not part of a book. It sets me up mentally. Look at these brushes. Look at these gorgeous colors. That's what happens if you keep your water clean and you wash your brush after each use and never leave the brush in a jar of water. Clean water, which means I have to get up from my desk and go into the bathroom and clean the water, but that's good exercise. And conditioner. Conditioner. I'm going to stop here for a minute because I want to talk about something that I learned in my travels, which was wonderful. 
If anyone here has had the experience of having a child in Suzuki violin or Suzuki viola or cello, you will know that the first two weeks are spent simply holding the bow. This is how the Japanese people prepare their children, prepare their children to learn these things. So it is with painting. This is a Japanese brush. I like to tell my classes of American children, you, if you were in Japan, you would no ink, no paint, no color, no crayon. You would learn the first week only how to hold your brush, how to clean your brush, how to dry your brush, and how to respect it. And I tell them a story that I learned at the American school in Japan in Tokyo. When one child left a paintbrush in a jar of water, and the bristles curved, and it was useless. And the teacher said, OK, Yoko, you didn't do that very well. You forgot your brush, didn't you? And she said, yes, I did. She said, I'm very sorry, Yoko. I'm going to have to call your mother. And the teacher got on the phone and said, Mrs. Yamaguchi, Yoko has left her brush in the water, and it is ruined. Please bring 30,000 yen to the school at $30 this afternoon to buy another one. Goodbye. Japanese parents have no trouble with this. Yoko had a lot of trouble that night, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is something we can learn from another culture. Respect for our materials and thriftiness. Respect for what we use our tools so that they are clean. And that is what I learned in Japan. American kids hate that story. They just hate it. But it's true, and they know it's true. Cleaning your brush without ever leaving it in there. And that's brush cleaner. And then drying it. As I mentioned, I don't like using pastels. They get all over my hands, all over my dog. I have to breathe them in. I only use them in the summer when I can keep the windows open. But they are both the most beautiful and permanent and fugitive colors in the whole spectrum of art materials. Why do I keep them in rice? Because it pollutes the dust less to have the rice in there. Now look at those two colors. I'm going to go back for a minute, if I can. I want to go back here. Look at that. Right in the rice. Did you see those colors on white paper? Look at them on white paper. No, we're not doing that right. In the box of rice to keep the red from polluting the green, the blue from polluting the yellow. It keeps the dust down. They're such beautiful colors. I could never get over them, even though they're a real pain to use. Look at that red on that white. That red is about as bright as red is ever going to be, and it's on white. Boys and girls, what is the brightest color on that page? White. Your eye goes to the white. That's why when I use pastels, and I want that paper, I want it to show up. Look what happens when you put it on a beautiful umber sandpaper. The sandpaper actually holds the pastel to the paper, and it comes in all colors. Oh, look at the artist's hands. Oh, boy. This way, using sandpaper, and you can see the texture of it, 
I can put pastels down and they don't smear. They don't come off the page. Here is blue sandpaper. And you can see this is mixed media. We have mom's kimono and the lampshade and frame in origami paper. We've got pastel on the chair and the lamp. We've got watercolor in the cat's eyes and Yoko's sweater. And it all looks beautiful on blue sandpaper. Sandpaper is very expensive. And you can't put it on a light table and you can't erase it. Once you put down your line, that's it. So what I do is a line drawing, and I print it on my printer very lightly on the sandpaper, and then I have an outline of what I want to draw. This is dark brown sandpaper, and you can see how beautiful the color comes right up and hits you in the eye. Now here's something no other artist that I know does. This is brown rice. But I'm not going to cook with this brown rice because I'm not in the kitchen. I'm at the copying machine. And I'm putting the brown rice onto the copy machine. As you can see, it's right on the Xerox there. And I'm going to make a nice pattern. I want you all to look at the beautiful texture of that. And I'm going to make a rectangle out of it. And I'm going to make a copy of the texture in black and white. And I'm going to send it to the White Plains Stamp and Die Company, who has long ago stopped thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> and they're going to make a huge stamp for me out of that color. Sometimes I use lentils. Sometimes I use tapioca. Food products are just wonderful. Here's that house again that we saw before. I wanted to make an entire neighborhood. So I made rubber stamps of four different houses and colored them in all differently. And people think to this day that I made 100 house drawings, but I didn't. It's all a rubber stamp. And it makes a beautiful neighborhood looking just like a real Levittown, a real neighborhood all differently colored in. The use of rubber stamps is endless, but you've got to mask them. So here is something called misket, which is, or frisket, which is a, uh, it's a, a plastic film with a sticky back. And you take a very, very sharp X-Acto knife and you cut out the parts that you don't want the stamp to hit. So I want to make a pattern on mom's dress. Everything in the picture is covered with frisket except mom's dress. And here is a stamp that I made out of crosshatch line, a very big one, but not the biggest. And I put it down and I press it down. I've only got one chance to do it. Otherwise, it gets smeared, and I got it. I got it just right. Now you can see how then I peel the frisket off from every other part of the drawing. These are little tricks that artists know, little sneaky tricks. Here is a tapioca stamp. I want to make a, a snowstorm around that house. But I don't want the snowstorm to cover the house. Look at that big magilla of a stamp. Whoa, what a stamp that is. So there's your snowstorm. But the house is preserved with frisket. We'll see that again. Here's a Cheerio stamp. Does everybody see those Cheerios? <laughs> You know it. I want it on her dress. And here is mini shredded wheat. Look at that. Everybody knows those cereals. And that's on his pants. And then when I'm finished stamping, I pull off the frisket. And the drawing is perfect. Most people don't notice these textures. But this is how you get a finished piece of art. Look at that rubber stamp. Wow, that's the brown rice that we saw on the Xerox machine. I'm going to stamp it in the Max and Ruby book. 
These give me textures. They make the drawings finish. They please the eye without ever really telling the eye what the eye is seeing. Most people don't realize that it's there at all, but it gives me something beautiful to look at and to finish the drawing. Here's a broom. You can see the straw from that broom, from that pattern. I don't always use stamps. I use a lot of spatter for backgrounds too. And that's a lot of fun. It's just a little scrub brush from the CVS. And I put that on and uh, there I have a picture of Max and I wanted a nice texture and pattern on the wall. Not that you'd notice if you looked at the book, unless you're an artist, but it just pleases the eye and it makes it professional. By this time, we know that although that spatter is all over Max's face, it isn't really all over Max's face at all because we pull the frisket off and have a perfectly clean bunny to color in against a background wall of green, yellow, and red dots. I also use origami paper in the Yoko books. I love to use this. Again, harking back to Japan, uh, the Japanese make the most extraordinary wood blocks in different colors, and I use them and incorporate them into the Yoko books. Here is how you put origami onto an easy chair, again using that knife and a rubber matting, mat cutting board, and upholstering the chair in beautiful red, gold, and blue and white uh, patterns. And when I was finished, this is another one of the teachery things that I like to say. When I was finished, I don't work alone. I work alone most of the time. But when I'm working on a book, I have to go into New York City and I have to confer with my editor and my art director and the sales staff, and a lot of different people who say, Rosemary, the book would be better if you did this. Or Rosemary, how about changing this? Or do you think you could do that one again because the expression isn't quite right? And I listen, I have to listen because I have to sell a book. I'm in business. This is a very small business that I run, but I gotta get it just right. And so I do. I go home. In this case, they said, Rosemary, that is a beautiful chair with Yoko in it, but we want a blue jacket and we feel that it's too bright for a blue background. So how about if you do it in green? And so I said, okay, I will. And I did, and it was better. I use a lot a huge library that I've collected over the years of amazing drawings when people still went to art school and learned how to draw instead of learning how to throw paint on canvases and do other weird things. Uh, I love the art, the commercial art of the early 20th century. Look at this little ad from a, an English newspaper or magazine. It shows a it shows a little lady who's got a checkered apron and she's got her bowl and her pitcher and she's making uh, something with Bradley's shredded beef, beef suet. I don't even want to think of what that would do to your arteries, but nonetheless, there she is doing it. And I just fell in love with this little picture. And this is how a direct inspiration from all of these books that I have in my library, I can bring to life by saying, oh, I love that little lady in her checked apron. And I'm gonna bring her to life, in this case, in the Mother Goose book. So you can see how that worked because there she is in my book and my illustrations, a little bit more active, but still the same person I love the art from that time, early 20th century drawing. Look at these geese. They came to life and came back in the world. 
on the cover of my Mother Goose book. That was originally a French advertisement for, for uh, Pate. I love the, the typefaces and the toys and find huge inspiration. Oh my goodness, who barked? That was Sophie. That is Sophie and she is behind every little creature that I have ever drawn. Is sort of based on my, my one after another West Highland Terriers. Now I'm going to give you all, before question time, I'm going to give you a little treat. I see no reason not to do this, but I have to find it. And I can find it on my screen, but my cursor is not on my screen. So I wanted that one. Can you do that for me? This is about pastels and you're going to love this because there's a shop in Paris, in the middle of Paris. It is only open on Thursday afternoons from two to four, no other time. It's run by Isabel Laroche, who is the great, great granddaughter of the founder. It makes the most beautiful pastels in the whole world. I went in there and I looked at every single one and I tried the trial ones. I did not buy any, even though they're the most beautiful pastels in the world. And I use pastels as you can see, because they were 30, dollars for a stick as big as my finger, 30 bucks. I said, I can't do that. I've got perfectly nice pastels. I'm just going to look. But in the meantime, yes. And we're going to look at Isabel and her pastels. And it only takes 10 minutes, but it is such a joy. It is a trip outside of Iowa or anywhere in the United States, and we're gonna look at it. So here it is, but it's not moving. Let's see if we can get it to go. Okay. Come to Paris, oh, we have sound. Do we have sound? Good, okay. Yes. And enjoy this with me. like batter.
it goes on, uh, but that, that is a wonderful little visit inside the making of uh, a, a very misunderstood uh, medium, uh, which I use uh, uh, at the best I can. Certainly not like the great artist, but I do the best I can using my sandpaper and I do use my fixative. I was so tempted to buy some of them. And I keep thinking if I go back to Paris, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get at least five. <laughs> So uh, that is my show for today. I am happy to answer anybody's question on anything involving children's book publishing, writing, uh, being a professional artist, uh, having a studio, which I do, or anything that you would like to come and, and you came out today and, and left your warm homes and, uh, and have uh, things you'd like me to elucidate on, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to answer your questions afterwards because I answered seven questions from you in the first session. So don't think I'm ignoring you, but other people are going to ask questions and then I'll get to it. Okay, Hakeem? Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. When is the next Kindergaters book coming out? It's not coming out because Harper, the publisher, declined to publish anymore. And that's part of my business. Uh, they said in the first five weeks it didn't sell nearly as much as Amelia Bedelia. And I said, well, it isn't really very well known, you know. And teachers take a while. And I really researched a lot on kindergaters, on both how, how you deal with problems in kids in school and what were the main problems the teachers faced. And I had this whole thing going, but there will be no kindergartners books, at least for a while. Can we because can you, the public and tell you, about that? you sure can. <laughs> <laughs> you sure can. <laughs> I'm a school counselor, and we are very, very fond of them. So. I'm glad you are. I know they work. But this is a very commercial house. And uh, it is, um, it's a commercial publisher. And they want things that sell a million copies the first day. And uh, they probably should not have published these. Should have been another publisher. So I will try to bring them to life again. Uh, not Never fear, but it has to wait a few years. Okay. So uh, I know that they're good. I looked into these problems. However, what I have done is I have a new series from Candlewick uh, called Felix and Fiona. And I'm bringing a lot of the ideas from the from the uh, uh, Kindergarten's books back into another series. I'm sort of like Julia Child. I don't let string beans sit in the refrigerator forever. I do something with them. And uh, I, I tend to recycle what I, I know to be good ideas that are popular. Yes? I love the idea of um, taking the origami and putting it on your ear. Yes. Um, No. Anything that the artist can use origami? No, because origami is printed just in millions. It's sort of in public domain. Nobody has ever asked me or worried about it. Yeah. You can buy it, and it, it just, um, uh, not that I know of. Can not that I know of. Like wallpaper or insert it pattern in? Do I what? Could, um, could people do that with wallpaper or insert it pattern? Well, I think with with certain wallpapers, uh, there is a copyright pro I wouldn't have want to advise anybody to just yeah. take anything. But uh, origami paper, or as it's called, washi paper, uh, uh, is um, is so common that there I, I doubt it goes back to an individual artist in, in any way. Wallpaper, though, is different. And it is uh, the wallpaper designs are owned by various companies. So I'd be careful with that. I don't recommend self-publishing, mostly because it is arduous. You have, one of the things about self-publishing is that you have a great deal of competition from other people who self-publish. You've got to be responsible for the printing, the distribution, the publicity, everything. It's too much, and you're not in publishing. You don't know how to do it. The competition you have from other people who self-publish is usually of, forgive me, a uh, minor or fourth tier quality. 
These books normally are books that have been rejected by other publishers. And so they're not terribly good. There are artists who, who really are not very professional. And so you got all this dross around you. And uh, I don't recommend it for a lot of reasons. If you're any good, you will be published, although it's hard to do, particularly now, because there's not much money in publishing and there's far too much that's published. I, my advice to everybody who would like to get into children's book writing is if you're a writer, don't hook up with some artist. Don't put pictures in belonging to someone else ever. You'll be immediately turned down. Join the SCBWI, Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. They are terrific and they know much more than I do about today's submissions uh, starting out. So that's what I would recommend. Keep at it until you get on one project maybe three rejections and then you've got to say to yourself, maybe I should put this in a drawer and start in on a different project or do something else because uh, publishers are always looking for something good and original and new. And when they find it, they will publish it. But it's very hard because publishing has very small staffs these days and you get a stack of submissions this high. There is so much competition. So that is what you're up against. But you're welcome. Yes. The cover is made by a lot of people. By the time I get the book to the publisher and to the art director, I have, uh, I have <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the pages of the book done. And very often, the publisher will then say, well, we love this page and this page. Can you combine them? Can you do something like this? Can you use the, the feeling from this? And that's how we do it. And then we change the title so that it works. And a lot of people cooperatively go into the making of a cover? Good question. Good question. Yes? Every book is different. Some are long, some are short. Uh, an average picture book, probably four months. I had a lady in the green sweater in the back. Yes? The character creations are, are very dear. They're, they're, the expressions on those little bunny characters on in Carry Me, in Yoko. Could you talk a little bit about how you develop the facial expressions and all the little lines around their eyes and the sweet little faces? I put the expression on my own face and let it run down my arm into my hand. <laughs> yes. How much minutes? Hours and days sometimes. A long time. Yes. How many books have you made? 136 books published. I have illustrated most of them, uh, not all of them. And among that are probably about 10 novels for either middle school readers or young adults. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I uh, by the way, to the lady in the back in the green sweater, I didn't mean to be dismissive of your question, but that really is the answer. You put the expression on your own face, and you feel it, and you let it run down your arm. And that's what being an artist is. Uh, try it. It works. <laughs> being an artist, by the way, and being a writer, particularly being a writer, is very, very close to one other art, which no one expects. It's very close to acting. Acting, theater. You've got to make a story believable. You've got to put something on the page that people are not going to get up in the intermission and walk out. You've got to make it believable, and you've got to hold your reader's attention. 
Now, as far as, as uh, my process is not the process of every other artist. I, we're all completely different. Everybody, however, who does write for children or adults will tell you exactly the same thing because it's true. And that is, it's my job to have ideas. That's my job. That's my job. The, the thing that I think about as a uh, metaphor or analogy for this is, I was once in a hospital waiting room for some minor reason with a very good friend who happened to be a teacher of nursing, wonderful nurse. And we looked across the room and there was a, an elderly woman who was obviously very uncomfortable. She was in a wheelchair and she was, she was nearly in tears. And my friend, I said, oh my God. See, I'm not a nurse. I look at this old lady in the wheelchair and she's going, ah, ah. And my friend who's the nurse knew what to do. I didn't know what to do. I started to panic. I nearly fainted. I have, oh my God. What's going to happen to this woman? Is she going to die? Is she having a heart? What, what's happening? Because I panic at things like that, being not a medically trained person. My friend who was the nurse said, no, this way. She went right over there. And she adjusted the foot lifts on a wheelchair, which will allow you to lift your feet and legs. And she just did that, and she did that with the other one. And the woman said, thank you. How did you know? And my friend Mimi said, it's my job. It's my job to have ideas. It's my job to do stuff, stuff that other people never do. I take an idea which comes to me. I actually find them. I find ideas. That's what writers do. And I find them and I structure them in a few seconds. Of my, is, that an, is that a book? How can I do that? Sometimes a whole book will come in three seconds. And I say, where is it going? What's the middle? What's the end? What are the characters? How can I make this work? Yes, why is it a book? Very important. Why is this a story that someone will else will read? When I go to schools, I do a whole writer's workshop, which I did the last hour, which is write for your reader, write for your reader to enjoy. Write simply, write clearly. Write so that it comes from your heart into somebody else's heart. That is a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. But it's something I seem to be able to do naturally. If there's any artistic skill in my family, it was my father who was an actor. And I know exactly how that worked. Because if I had the time, I would do that too. Just turn yourself into somebody else. Have you ever noticed how particularly some of the great uh, stars of the British London stage and of, of um, uh, the BBC TV, uh, as opposed to some of our movie stars are always the same character, how some of these actors are so wonderful they can play a terrible person one week and a wonderful person the next week and an old person and a young person and they, they just fall into a different role. And it's the same person, but they virtually change themselves. And this is what writing and to an extent illustration is all about. Becoming a different world, creating an entire world which is personal to you, but not egocentric. Never egocentric. A personal world which is automatically transferable to another person. That's what happens on the stage with a great actor, and that's what a writer tries to do. I always write my story first. I never lead with a drawing. I always lead with a, a beginning, which is what I call a situation. I love the word situation. You know, workmen, carpenters, and people, contractors always, I love the way they say this. They're trying to renovate a bathroom in your house, and the ceiling falls in, and this nice young contractor gets on the phone with his boss and says, uh, Peter, we have a situation. <laughs> we have a situation. <laughs> He's never going to say we have a disaster because, or we have a catastrophe because that's not how guys 
run businesses. <laughs> they don't like that. They have situations. Well, I start with a situation. And when I have a good enough situation, <coughs> excuse me, then I know that I have a story. And I have to figure out whether enough is going to happen to keep your interest. And then I have to figure out what is a good ending. And this wonderful young man in the first seat who was in my last session asked me a terrific question. He said, I've read plenty of novels that don't have happy endings. And we had a discussion about not necessarily a happy ending. It doesn't have to be a happy ending, although in children's books, it should be. It shouldn't be a bad ending. But <clears throat> it should be above everything a satisfactory conclusion to the situation. It has to be believable. It has to be part and parcel of a smooth trip from situation to conclusion. Once I have that, I start the drawings. And does it go somewhere other? No, because I've spent so much time organizing this book, I know exactly where it's going. If I let things get out of hand, I would never get anything done. And I have to, as you see, not waste time. Not waste time and not waste money. And not leave the brushes in the water. <laughs> yes? I wonder about the, the success of characters like Max and Ruby, and obviously a lot of fans have now touched those characters in, uh, in other media. I just wonder how that changed your relationship or things you've learned about yourself or about how you deal with characters through that experience. Not at all, because... I really have nothing to do with the television. I sold the rights to Max and Ruby. They took off with it. I would say I know kids love it and enjoy it. And it's one thing very, very, very important, particularly in this day of violent media on video games, on our television, on our movie screens, terrifying pictures advertising movies, inappropriate material for children which I'm very much against because I think it's what makes us uh, uh, less than exceptional. I, I think that there needs to be some, uh, some lines drawn in Hollywood. Max and Ruby is wholesome, and that's a good thing. And if I'm behind something that's wholesome in the media, then so much the better. However, I have nothing to do with how it looks in the beginning, I worked very hard with the animators so they get the look of it right. But after a while, you know, there are about 25 Max and Ruby books, each one thought out extremely well in my process, which is very demanding to myself. But after when you've got 30 shows per year and there have been 10 years, they run out of stories. A lot of them are written. The scripts are written by people who really don't know children too much. And they just throw them out, and they, they get into a formula. And I really have nothing to do with it. It's a pretty good show. But it's the books where I am, and that is unchanging. And I would never let, I'm sorry to say this, it sounds really snobbish and terribly elitist, but I would never allow anything as vulgar as a television show to affect my own concept of what I want to do with my work. I would never allow that to happen. They do what they do, and that's just fine, and kids are going to enjoy it, and that's, that's good. But I wouldn't allow it out ever to affect me. There are things, there are places as an artist, if you have something to say to the world where you have to draw the line, and you have to say, I'm not just going to do a whole bunch of books, a whole series uh, just to make money or just to do something repeatedly, or just because it sells, and do it quickly. Every book I do, I think out. And if I ever stop doing that 10-minute practice in the morning, I will say, then maybe it's time I stop. But I, I don't stop doing that practice. And I, I try to keep my work, every single one, a little better than the next. Always to speak to parents, always to speak to children, to say, in these books is the joy of reading. In these books is the joy of ideas and of escape and of a different world. I remember as a child, I was so in love with the few books we had. We certainly didn't have books like kids do now. No way. They're like 
you know, maybe 20 books that we were allowed to read, and that was it. And uh, so we read them again and again and again, and they never spoiled. But I remember the joy of escaping, and I did not have a hard life to escape from. I had a wonderful, comfortable life as a child with a loving family, but I still wanted to escape, and I remember that need. And that's what I try to do, particularly in my older books for kids, give them a new world to think about, very often in history. I want to just say one thing, because I'm going to wrap up now, uh, to this group uh, here in the library today. I don't have to preach to the choir. Every one of you knows how important stories and books and reading are. Every child here in this audience has a wonderful mother and dad who are reinforcing that idea. There is nothing like books, and I mean on paper books, not books on Kindles for very young children, on paper books. And there is nothing like it. There's nothing like the quiet time at the end of the day when you read aloud and you listen to your mother's voice. I'll close with one anecdote, and I'm sure you'll all know what I mean. This happened many years ago when uh, my daughter Victoria was about seven or eight. <clears throat> and I remember it was bedtime. I looked upstairs from the kitchen, and I, I could see the light under her door. And I said, honey, it's bedtime. That was five minutes ago. I want to see that light out. I went back in the kitchen. Five minutes later, nothing happened. No light out. I said, you have a math test tomorrow. Five minutes later, the light was still there. So I said, OK. I went upstairs, knocked on her door. No answer. Tried the handle and I looked in. And she said, she was in bed with a Nancy Drew. And she said, Oh, Ma. I said, Didn't you hear me? She said, No. She said, No, I didn't hear you. I yelled, No, I didn't hear you. You have to understand, nothing was here. You weren't here. Even this room and I wasn't here. And we all have these moments where something goes through our mind, whether we want it to or not. It just goes scooting through. And I remember what I thought then, which was, OK, I can die now. She'll be all right. <laughs> Thank you for coming out.